and welcome to this talk on behalf of the Friends of Nottinghamshire Archives as part of the Phonobite series. I'm Judith Mills and I'd like to tell you about Bridget Sutton, 3rd Duchess of Rutland, and the Lexington Memorial at Kenham Church. Bridget Sutton was the third and youngest daughter of the second Lord Lexington, Robert Sutton, and his wife Margaret. Although their family home was Kelham, Bridget probably spent most of her younger years overseas. Robert Sutton was a uh, Privy Councillor for William and Mary, Queen Anne and George I, and served as Ambassador in the courts of Vienna, Milan, Brandenburg and probably other places. Bridget's older brother William and older sister Cordelia were both born in Vienna and William died in Madrid aged 15. Cornelia also died quite young at the age of 20, leaving Bridget as her father's sole child. In 1717, age 17, Bridget married John Manners, Marquis of Granby. He was the oldest son of the second Duke of Rutland. So when he died in 1721, John and Bridget became the third Duke and Duchess. In 1718, one year after their marriage, Bridget had her first child, and in the next ten years she had a further ten children, including a set of twins. Sadly, most of them died. Three as infants, two, three reached the age of five or six, and two as teenagers. Uh, consequently, she only had three surviving children. In 1726, her father died and his large, extensive and very detailed will is uh, held, well a copy of it is held in Nottinghamshire archives. In it, as his sole heir, he left all of his estates to Bridget. I mean, these extended to Kellam, Aram, Knapthorpe, Cornton, Park Lathes, which we now call Park Lees, Rolston, Syston, Harby, Clifton, Flinton, Elston and Newark. They were left to Bridget in trust for her lifetime. There are a number of good reasons for leaving these properties in trust to her. First of all, of course, in the 18th century, a married woman could not hold property in her own right. Uh, all real estate, land, houses and so on, uh, immediately became the property of a husband. So by putting it in trust, Robert protected his estates from being absorbed into the Manners family estates. Secondly, he appointed three trustees to whom all the income from these estates was to be paid, but they had to hand the income over to Bridget immediately. In other words, she was given an income, an extensive independent income, over which her husband had no control. Thirdly, by creating a trust, Robert was able to dictate who inherited his lands after Bridget's death. But I'll come back to that later. But Robert also put some conditions in his will. The first was for uh, Bridget to uh, extend, renovate and extend the family home, Kellam Hall, at a cost of £500 per year until it was finished. This was an extensive building project which took five or six years to complete. The second was to create a decent tomb for him, those are his words as in the will, uh, at a cost of £500 to be completed within two years of his death. Once completed, he was to be interred there with his wife, son, daughter, and two of Bridget's children who had been um, buried at Rolston. Bridget immediately set about erecting a, a chapel. Uh, as you can see, it's on the south side of uh, the chancel of Kellam Church. We usually refer to it as the Le Lexington Chapel, but as it was never intended for worship, it's more correctly a mausoleum or memorial. The accounts for the building the, the mausoleum are held in the private archive at Beaver Castle and a couple of years ago I was fortunate enough 
to get permission from the present Duke to look at these papers. They're a very detailed record showing costs of materials, labour, naming some of the masters and craftsmen and labourers who worked on it. The overall work was, uh, the work was overseen by John Wildsmith. Uh, one of his jobs was to source and uh, bring to Kellum all the stone needed to build the mausoleum. And the, the excessive cost of this actually put him in significant debt, which the Duchess paid off on his behalf directly to, the credit, to his creditors. There's also a Mason's Bill which lists materials, but it's unclear whether it's a list of the cost of the materials or the costs of Masons putting the materials together to build the mausoleum. However, it lists 2,200 solid foot of stone and carriage at 12 pence per foot, 2,165 foot of plain ashlar at 3 pence a foot working. That suggests it's for um, construction. 345 foot of cornice at 8 pence a foot, 303 foot of circular work. This could be the windows to the mausoleum or it could be the niches that are created within the mausoleum. And then 44 foot of step, that's presumably the steps down to the vault below. Other payments include one pound four shillings and a penny paid to James Brown for cellaring the monument down. And a Richard Oddie received £46.16 shillings for ironwork. That was possibly for creating the windows. On top of that was the cost of carving the monument itself. This was done by William Palmer, Master Mason at Lincoln's Inn. One of British trustees was Penniston Lamb, uh, and he was also the Sutton family solicitor. He practised at Lincoln's Inn, so it was probably through him that Palmer got the commission. The cost of carving the monument came to £370.15, shillings. so adding all the costs that I was able to identify together, I'd come up with an estimated total of £643.18 shillings and a penny, or nearly £150 over budget but there were probably other costs as well, which I haven't been able to find. Now the entrance to the mausoleum from the chancel was, is a classical arch in the Roman style, but a 19th century renovation of the church uh, inserted this uh, med reno restored medieval screen. The tomb itself is centre of the chapel and as you can see from this photo Robert is depicted as a Roman senator reflecting his role in government and as a diplomat. In his left hand he holds his baronial coronet denoting his title of second Baron Lexington. In his right hand is a book a symbol of learning and knowledge and his right elbow rests on a skull clearly a memento mori, or reminder that death comes to everyone. His wife is dressed as a Roman matron. Um, matrons were seen as uh, models of virtue. Around three sides of the base is a history of the Sutton family, and on the fourth side is the family coat of arms. According to the inscription, Robert's wife, Bridget's mother, had such beauties of her mind and person that she was esteemed and reverenced, while Robert is said to have had such a captivating and rare sweetness of his manners and conversation that he lived without enemies, probably a great asset to an international diplomat. To Bridget, he was the most indulgent and best father. I'd like to thank Jeff Buxton for permission to use these photographs, but I also have to point out that since they were taken, 300 years of dust and grime have been cleaned and now the statues are a, a glistening white. Bridget didn't just restrict herself to the tomb, she paid for the chancel to be paved and for the window next to her pew, this would be a box pew reserved for her use, uh, to be glazed with crown glass. She may well have paid for other improvements to the church but I've um, 
yet to identify. Bridget died in 1734, aged 34. According to the parish record, she was bur buried in Kellam Church on the 28th of June. But there's a mystery here. There isn't a plaque or memorial either in the Lexington Chapel or in the body of the church. And according to the Family History Society's survey of the churchyard, there isn't a marker to her there either. Now it's possible she was moved to another church. Bottisford is the obvious one, being the closest to Beaver Castle. But the local history society there tells me that they have no record of her. And she doesn't appear to be in the Manners family mausoleum in the grounds of Beaver Castle. So perhaps she is interred at Kellam, but it's still odd that there's no memorial or marker to her at all. But maybe I'll find out one day. I now want to return briefly to Robert Sutton's will. At the time of his death, Bridget only had one infant son and had already lost two or three children. So Robert was anxious to ensure the, who would inherit his estates. The detailed will is very long because he names his cousins and their sons, first, second, third sons ad infinitum, should Bridget die without an heir. Fortunately, she had three surviving sons. But there were further conditions because whoever in inherited his estates had to change their name from Manners, their father's family name, to Sutton, Bridget's father's family name. Now Bridget's first son, John, who had taken the title Marquis of Granby, was of course the, destined to be the fourth Duke of Rutland. It was therefore inconceivable that he should change his name. Uh, just incidentally, he's the Marquis of Granby after whom all the pubs are named and he actually died before his father. So it was his son, Bridget's grandson, who became the fourth Duke. It was in fact Bridget's second son, Robert, who inherited. Uh, he changed his name from Manners to Manners Sutton, which is perhaps something of a compromise combining the two family names. He died in 1760 and having never married had no heirs. So the estates were inherited by his younger brother George who also changed his name to Manor Sutton. And the lands remained within the Manor Sutton family until the early 20th century, thus continuing Bridget's legacy. Unfortunately, in the early 20th century, they were sold for financial reasons. I hope you found the talk interesting. If you'd like to know more about the subject, or about the Friends of Nottinghamshire Archives, email us, look us up on our website, or find us on Facebook. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.